Good evening, Dr. Phil here. Today we will be discussing on intracranial pressure. Monroe Kelly Doctrine and Compensation for Raised ICP Introduction Cerebral perfusion pressure equals mean arterial pressure minus central venous pressure plus intracranial pressure. Normal CPP is 70 to 80 mmHg. Normal ICP values vary depending on literature source. For example, in a research by Doon LT in 2002, it is quoted that normal ICP for adults is 10 to 15 mmHg, in children is 3 to 7 mmHg, and term infants 1.5 to 6 mmHg. Alterations in ICP reach clinical significance when they are sustained longer than at least 5 minutes. Normal CBF is 50 ml per 100 g of brain tissue per minute. Can you refer to the video on cerebral blood flow for further details? During increased intracranial pressure, CPP equals MAP minus ICP. Thus, in order to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure when ICP is raised, mean arterial pressure must also increase. CPP and CBF can be related to the hagen poisson equation for laminar flow, where flow rate equals P1 minus P2 times R to the power of 4 times pi divided by 8 times L times eta, where P1 minus P2 is the pressure gradient, is related to the cerebral perfusion pressure. R is the radius of the tube. It is related to the radius of cerebral blood vessels. L is length of the tube, which is related to the length of cerebral blood vessels. And eta represents viscosity of the fluid and is related to the hematocrit of blood flowing to the brain. As ICP increases, Cerebral blood flow will be maintained until CPP falls below 50 mm mercury. Critical ischemia occurs at cerebral perfusion pressure of 30 to 40 mm mercury. At a CBF of less than 18 to 20 ml per 100 g per minute, brain cell death occurs. Focal ischemia in the region of a mass lesion can occur. Increased ICP attenuates cerebral autoregulation until it is lost completely. When cerebral autoregulation is lost, cerebral blood flow follows MAP passively. The Monroe Kelly Doctrine states that as a skull is a rigid container of constant volume, any increase in the volume of one of the skull's contents must be compensated for by a reduction in volume of another if a rise in ICP is to be avoided. Intracranial contents in adults, brain tissue, 1,400 to 1,500 gram or 80 to 85 percent. Blood, 100 to 150 mils, where venous blood constitutes 6 to 7 percent and arterial blood constitutes 3 to 4 percent. CSF, 110 to 120 mils or 10 percent. Extracellular fluid, less than 100 mils. Compensation for a raised ICP. There are three stages of compensation as ICP increases. Decreased venous blood volume followed by decreased CSF volume followed by decreased arterial blood volume. The x-axis represents the intracranial volume. It is usually drawn without any units. The y-axis represents intracranial pressure in millimeters mercury. At the left side of the curve, this represents normal intracranial volume in keeping with 5 to 10 mmHg. The curve is a positive tear away exponential curve with 4 zones. The first zone in blue represents baseline intracranial volume with good compensatory reserve and high compliance. The second zone is represented in yellow where gradual depletion of compensatory reserve occurs as intracranial volume increases. The third zone is represented by the red line where poor compensatory reserve and increased risk of cerebral ischemia and herniation occurs. The last zone is represented in grey where critically high ICP with collapse of cerebral microvasculature and disturbed cerebral vascular reactivity occurs. As a summary, compensation for increase in volume of one intracranial component maintains the ICP below 20 mmHg initially. However, a sharp rise in ICP occurs when compensatory mechanisms are exhausted. Focal ischemia occurs at ICP of 20 to 45 mmHg. Global ischemia occurs when ICP exceeds 45 mm mercury. Brain compliance. Compliance refers to change in volume for a given change in pressure. 
Concerning ICP, brain compliance refers to the degree of change in ICP in response to a change in intracranial volume. It is a measure used to indicate the degree of compensatory reserve before a dangerous rise in ICP occurs. When the brain is compliant, referring to the intracranial volume pressure relationship curve, an initial small increase in intracranial volume results in little or no increase in ICP. When the brain has decreased compliance, referring to the intracranial volume pressure relationship curve, subsequent increases in intracranial volume results in large increases in ICP. Next, we move on to the intracranial pressure waveform. Indications for ICP waveform monitoring includes closed head injury, in patients with traumatic brain injury, a Glasgow coma score of less than 8T after resuscitation, and after reversal of paralytics or sedatives that may have been used during intubation, having either abnormalities in CT of the head, or meet at least two of the following three criteria, age more than 40 years old, systolic blood pressure less than 90 mm mercury, and abnormal posturing. An awake patient who is at risk of increased ICP under general anesthesia, where clinical assessment for symptoms or signs of raised ICP is not possible, for a necessary non-neurosurgical procedure, such as a limb-saving procedure. The next indication, intubated patients who have non-surgical intracranial hemorrhage where clinical assessment for symptoms or signs of raised ICP is not feasible. In patients with moderate head injury and brain contusions that are at risk of evolving, for lesions in the temporal fossa, extreme caution and clinical judgment must be exercised as their proximity to the brainstem can lead to catastrophic herniation and brainstem compression with little change in the global ICP. In patients who have just undergone brain tumor or AVM resection, who are at risk for cerebral edema, where clinical assessment for symptoms or signs of raised ICP is not possible. The ICP wave. It is a modified arterial pressure wave that is transmitted from the large cerebral blood vessels throughout the CSF. There are three components, a respiratory component, whereby the baseline of the waveform varies with the respiratory cycle at 0.1 to 0.3 Hz. A pulse pressure waveform, frequency is equal to the heart rate. It is subdivided into P1, P2 and P3, which will be discussed further. Slow vasogenic waves, this refers to the changes in the baseline of the waveform. The pulse pressure waveform, x-axis represents time in seconds, y-axis represents intracranial pressure in millimeters mercury. Each waveform has the same duration as an arterial trace, but lags slightly behind the arterial trace. The dotted line represents the upper limit of normal ICP at 20 millimeters mercury. The normal ICP pulse pressure waveform has three peaks or waves of decreasing amplitude which are named P1, P2, and P3. P1 is known as the percussive wave. It is the result of the transmitted arterial pressure wave. If the P1 waveform decreases in the absence of raised ICP, it could be interpreted as vasospasm. P2, also known as tidal wave, reflects brain compliance and is probably due to the arterial waveform reflecting off the brain parenchyma. Typically, it is 80% of the amplitude of P1, its amplitude varies inversely with brain compliance. It ends with the dichrotic notch, which coincides with the closure of the aortic valve. P3 is known as the dichrotic wave. It is related to the central venous pressure. P3 increases as CVP increases. In the non-compliant brain, the amplitude of P2 is more than P1. The whole waveform becomes more rounded. The baseline of the wave increases as ICP increases. Increasing amplitude of the waveform suggests rising intracranial pressure. ICP waveform is measured using an external ventricular drain placed in the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle or subarachnoid bulb. Other methods will be discussed later. Changes to the baseline of the ICP trace. ICP monitoring is most commonly used to measure mean ICP values and to use mean ICP to calculate cerebral perfusion pressure, 
so that it may be optimized. However, abnormalities in ICP waveforms have been described to identify intracranial pathology. Lundberg A waves, also known as plateau waves, a steep rise of ICP baseline lasting for 2 to 20 minutes is followed by an abrupt fall to the previous lower baseline. This indicates a significant decrease in brain compliance and is always pathological. The abrupt fall seen in this waveform can indicate reduced intracranial pressure due to early brain herniation or compensation for increased intracranial pressure from intact cerebral blood flow autoregulation. Lundberg B waves ICP rises by 20 to 30 mmHg, then falls to baseline. Sharply peak rhythmic oscillations occur at 0.5 to 2 waves per minute as the ICP rises and falls. This is associated with an unstable ICP and is possibly the result of cerebral vasospasm. Increased velocity in the middle cerebral artery can be demonstrated on transcranial Doppler during Lundberg B waves. Lundberg B waves suggest intact cerebral blood flow autoregulation. If peak rhythmic oscillations are ramped, it can be correlated to increases in PCO2 associated with snoring in sleep apnea. Increase in PCO2 vasodilate cerebral blood vessels resulting in increased intracranial blood volume and increased ICP. Lundberg C waves, oscillations that occur at 4 to 8 waves per minute. Oscillations peak at 20 mm mercury. It is thought to be related to changes in systemic vasomotor tone. It may either be a normal finding where ICP interacts between cardiac and respiratory cycles or suggestive of increased ICP. With rising ICP, oscillations of the ICP waveform with respiratory cycles become more and more difficult to discern and it disappears when ICP is more than 50 mmHg. Other ICP waveform parameters Pulse amplitude, AMP, is isolated from spectral analysis of the ICP pulse pressure waveform. Higher AMP is associated with lower brain compliance. The RAP coefficient is the correlation coefficient R between the AMP amplitude A and the mean ICP. It indicates how pulse amplitude of ICP correlates with mean ICP over 1 to 2 minutes. It reflects the brain's compensatory reserve and the patient's position on the pressure volume curve. It is influenced by brain elasticity, pulsatile arterial inflow, delay of inflow and outflow of venous blood and CSF, and basal ICP measurement errors due to spontaneous drifts or shifts. When RAP equals zero, it occurs at the linear part of the pressure volume curve at low ICP. It indicates good compensatory reserve and brain compliance. When RAP coefficient is plus one, this occurs at the ascending exponential part at moderately increased ICP. It indicates a low compensatory reserve. When RAP coefficient is negative one, as ICP increases even further, RAP becomes negative as AMP will decrease due to disturbed CBF and collapse of the cerebral microvasculature. This indicates increased intracranial volume and decreased autoregulatory reserve. Brain herniation, RAP oscillates or decreases to zero or negative values. An ICP of more than 20 mm mercury for more than 6 hours plus RAP of less than 0.5 is a predictor of unfavorable outcomes. RAP weighted ICP. RAP weighted ICP measurements display superior outcome association for both alive or dead and favorable or unfavorable dichotomized outcomes in adult traumatic brain injury cases through univariate analysis in a study done by Zeller FA et al. in 2019. Pressure reactivity index or PRX. It is the time average correlation coefficient between ICP and arterial blood pressure over 4 minutes. Values range negative 1 to positive 1. With intact pressure reactivity, increase in MAP results in cerebral vessel constriction within 5 to 10 seconds and subsequently a decrease in cerebral blood volume but no change in the ICP. The inverse happens with a decrease in MAP. A positive PRX indicates an impaired autoregulatory capacity of the brain. PRX of more than 0.2 for more than 6 hours is associated with increased mortality. A negative to zero PRX reflects a normal autoregulatory capacity. 
Limitation of PRX, it needs waveform data for its derivation. Long PRX has been developed to allow similar measurements without the need for waveform measurements. Auto-regulation weighted ICP and CPP, waveform analysis using deep machine learning algorithms, and ICP monitoring plus brain tissue oxygenation management protocols are undergoing development. Next, we move on to measurement of intracranial pressure. Research evidence indicating that ICP monitoring improves clinical outcomes is not strong. Compared with patients who were managed without ICP monitoring, many studies show that ICP monitoring is associated with increased mortality, increased length of hospital stay, increased complications, and increased utilization of hospital resources. For example, the best trip trial showed no difference in outcomes between a treatment protocol based on ICP monitoring versus that based on imaging and clinical examination. However, future research may indicate otherwise with advances in ICP monitoring technology. Invasive methods Intraventricular catheters Also known as external ventricular drain, it is the gold standard for ICP monitoring. Mechanism Typically, a burr hole is made and the catheter is passed through the parenchyma of the brain to be positioned in the lateral ventricle, most commonly the right frontal area. The pressure in the catheter equilibrates with the intraventricular pressure and the pressure is transmitted to an external saline filled tube through a strain gauge transducer from which the pressure measurement is made. The external auditory meatus is the external transducer reference point. It approximates to the intracerebral center where the foramina of Monroe link the lateral ventricles with the third ventricle. Regarding CSF circulation, can you refer to the video on CSF for further details? Advantages of intraventricular catheters includes it is the most accurate method of measuring ICP, it allows global ICP measurements, it allows external calibration and recalibration of catheters in situ. These catheters can be used to drain CSF and administer drugs such as antibiotics into the CSF. Disadvantages It is difficult to insert in patients with small ventricles, for example due to congenital causes or ventricular compression from cerebral edema. Complications of EVD includes infection, catheter occlusion, and hemorrhage. Subarachnoid screw It is a fluid-based system. It is inserted through a skull burr hole whose tip projects through the dura into the subarachnoid space. Advantages, it is less invasive than other methods. Disadvantages, it is less accurate, cannot drain CSF, and considerable risk of local wound infection is present. Implantable microtransducers. It utilizes other technologies to transduce pressures instead of a column of fluid. For example, fiber optic sensors, strain gauge devices, and pneumatic sensors. Fiber optic sensors, raised ICP causes displacement of miniature mirrors at the end of fiber optic cables. Reflection of light of varying intensity is transduced into pressure. Strain gauge devices, ICP changes causes a diaphragm to bend, leading to changes in the electrical resistance, which are used to calculate ICP. Pneumatic sensors, the pressure of the balloon in the distal end of the probe is used to approximate the pressure of the surrounding tissues. These microtransducer probe tips are placed intraparenchymally, which is the most common location. Other compartments such as intraventricular, subarachnoid, subdural and epidural locations have been proven to be unreliable. Advantages of implantable microtransducers It is useful when extreme ventricular compression precludes the insertion of intraventricular catheters and where CSF drainage is not necessary. There are lower infection rates, lower risk of hemorrhage, and it is easier to place compared to EVD. Disadvantages It is more expensive. It cannot be recalibrated once they are in their final position. It cannot sample CSF for analysis. cannot drain CSF for ICP reduction cannot administer drugs into the CSF, it may only be able to measure local rather than global ICP, and zero drift occurs with implantable microtransducers. Telemetric sensors Long-term ICP monitoring is required to detect VP shunt malfunction 
and assess ICP in patients with chronic intracranial hypertension disorders. EVD and BOTS risk CNS infection. Helimetric sensors are strain gauge microtransducers in a housing unit implanted subcutaneously that has an element that extends intracranially through a small burr hole in the skull. Changes in ICP results in changes in circuit resistance, which are recorded in a microchip and read using an external device by the clinician. Examples of telemetric sensors include the Neurovent PTEL, Sensor Reservoir, and Osaka Telesensor. Non-invasive methods Advantages of these methods include their relative safety, low cost, and easy access. Disadvantages, it is able to confirm intracranial hypertension but are unable to produce a surrogate numerical value for intracranial pressure. Transcranial Doppler It is a rapid non-invasive real-time method to assess cerebrovascular function and it can also be used to assess ICP. It can be used in clinical practice to assess relative changes in cerebral blood flow, diagnose focal vascular stenosis, detect embolic signals, assess the physiologic health of a particular vascular territory by measuring blood flow responses to changes in blood pressure, changes in end-tidal CO2, and cognitive and motor activation. It can be used to detect raised ICP and helps in clinical diagnosis in acute ischemic stroke, vasospasm, subarachnoid hemorrhage, sickle cell disease, brain death, etc. The velocity of blood flow through large cerebral arteries, such as the middle cerebral artery, is measured using the principles of the Doppler effect. The diameter of the measured artery has to be determined and must not vary much for the flow indices to be accurate. Flow indices are derived such as peak systolic velocity and diastolic velocity, systolic upstroke or acceleration time, pulsatility index, and time averaged mean maximum velocity. A number of TCD-derived data have shown correlation with invasively measured ICP. A combined model derived ICP estimate is calculated based on flow velocity in the middle cerebral artery, arterial blood pressure, and pulsatility index. Computational modeling continues to make TCD-based ICP estimates more accurate. Advantages, it is portable, non-invasive, widely available, and ability to perform repeated measures at the bedside with high temporal resolution. Disadvantages, intra- and inter-observer variability, false positive cases in patients that are hyperventilating, patients with diffuse intravascular disease, hyperdynamic circulatory states, and severe cardiac regurgitation. It provides a one-time measurement only and has potential as a screening tool but is inadequate for continuous monitoring. Skull characteristics limit transmission of ultrasound waves in 10-15% to of patients, making TCD difficult to interpret. Overall, TCD-based assessment of CBF and autoregulation has been more successful than TCD-based ICP estimations. Transcranial ultrasound measurement of septum pellucidum undulations, SPU. The extent of septum pellucidum undulations relative to the ventricular wall during short 20 degrees rotatory movements of the head is related to ICP. In decreased ICP, the relaxed SP undulates at a higher amplitude than surrounding structures. As ICP increases, SP will be taut and undulates with amplitude similar to that of the surrounding brain parenchyma and ventricles. In predicting ICP of more than 20 cmH2O, it has a sensitivity of 75% and specificity of 100%. Pulsed phase lock loop, PPLL. An ultrasound signal is generated by the PPLL device and is transmitted through the temporal bone. It travels through the brain tissue and is reflected by the contralateral side of the skull back to the transducer. Slight movement of the skull associated with ICP pulsations are recorded by the PPLL device. A small study showed a high correlation between ICP waveforms recorded by PPLL and invasively by a fiber optic parenchymal device. Limitations It is limited to recording waveforms and not able to record ICP as a numerical value. Tympanic membrane displacement It measures the displacement of the tympanic membrane in response to the stapedial or middle ear reflex. 
Significant differences are present in the TMD between patients with raised and normal ICP. Advantages It has shown some benefit in monitoring a single patient longitudinally as an outpatient, decreasing the need for invasive ICP measurements in shunted patients with hydrocephalus. Disadvantages Intersubject variability, low predictive value, and requires an intact tympanic membrane and perilymphatic duct. Optic nerve sheath diameter ONSD. Raised ICP can be transmitted through the CSF in the intracranial subarachnoid space to the perineural optic nerve subarachnoid space of the optic nerve sheath. The optic nerve is still surrounded by the dural sheath as it exits the intracranial space into the orbit. Optic nerve sheath dilation due to raised ICP can be measured by transocular ultrasonography, CT or MRI scans. Ultrasound ONSD measurements correlate to invasively measured ICP with a sensitivity of 90% and specificity of 85%. An ONSD diameter of 5.6 mm has been suggested as the optimal cutoff point for diagnosing elevated ICP. Optic nerve sheath diameter is useful as a screening test for raised ICP in settings where invasive monitoring is not promptly available. Disadvantages Intra and inter observer variability, it cannot be used in patients with face trauma. It is inaccurate in patients with medical diseases that affect the optic nerve sheath diameter, such as Graves' disease and sarcoidosis. Specificity of ONSD wanes when there are acute fluctuations in ICP. Optical coherence tomography is a technology in development. It depends on the transmission of ICP through the optic nerve sheath to assess ICP. CT or MRI brain-based methods Various anatomic changes are associated with raised ICP on brain scans, such as space-occupying lesion, compression of ventricles, midline shift, hydrocephalus, cerebral edema, where sarcal volume measurements has been used to quantify cerebral edema in CT brain, loss of differentiation of grey and white matter junctions, and cerebral herniation. Examples of advanced scanning protocols to detect raised ICP Extended CT perfusion imaging has been used to measure plasmatic volume per unit of tissue volume, extravascular extracellular space volume per unit of tissue volume, blood-brain barrier permeability by calculating the bidirectional washout rates of contrast between the vascular space to the extravascular extracellular space and vice versa, and plasma flow. CT determine ratio of CSF volume to total intracranial volume, an MRI assessment of net transcranial blood and CSF flow. Limitations Use of brain imaging techniques are not reliable enough as screening tools for raised ICP. High resource utilization of imaging and very intermittent measurements can only be performed if brain imaging is used to monitor ICP or cerebral edema. Several methods are in development to measure cerebral edema in real time, such as thermal diffusion probes, Ion selective electrodes, electrical resistance probes, cerebral electrical impedance monitor, non invasive near infrared spectroscopy. Serum markers under investigation for cerebral edema or brain injury include endothelin 1, matrix metalloproteinase 9, and cellular fibronectin. Kindly refer to the research done by Muhammad I. Hirzala in 2016 for further details. These are my references. Thank you.